Hi everybody. So this will be your first introduction to the material that we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about mechanics in this class. Now mechanics is not fixing your car, although that's probably a more common term for it. Mechanics is the study of motion. And one of the first things we have to be able to do is to be able to describe that motion, and that's called kinematics. Later on then, we're going to learn how to talk about the causes of that motion, and that's called dynamics. The two fields together, kinematics and dynamics, make up mechanics that we'll be working with. So before we can go too far with this, if we're going to try to describe something, we all have to agree on the terms that we're going to use to describe that. So we'll talk about it later on as we get through the lecture, but you probably heard the term velocity. You've probably heard the term speed. What's the difference between those two? You've heard the term distance. You may or may not have heard the term displacement. And again, we need to know what is the difference between those two. So we're, what we're going to do for the rest of this week, for this lecture and the next one, is we're mostly going to be defining what we mean by these terms. And more importantly, we're also going to learn how to observe on a graph what that means. Because a big part of what you're going to be doing in the real world is you're going to be looking at the graphs of data that you get from, from the things that you're doing, things you're building and testing. You, know, you put a, a rocket on a test stand, you do a vibration test to make sure that the spacecraft's not going to shake itself apart. You might be working on, a, on testing a new material, stealth composites, or anything like that. The reality is, in the real world, you're not going to use equations for very much because there's too many other factors coming into play for you to be able to interpret that with just even one or a dozen equations. Instead, you're going to get your data in the form of a graph, but it's up to you to learn how to take that graph and interpret it in such a way that you can tell what was physically going on with the device or whatever it is that you're testing with that. This is where that time begins. Let's get started. Okay, so when we're working with physics and engineering, we've got to be really precise about the terms that we're using. Some of the everyday words that maybe you've used don't actually have a very clear meaning. And if you're trying to build a robot or a spacecraft or pretty much anything you want to do in life, if we're not all communicating on the same page, then we're not going to agree on the results that we get. So what we're going to be looking at for the next two lectures is defining some of the terms that you maybe have heard before, but didn't quite have a good lock on what the actual definition is. So to start off with, let's talk about the displacement versus the distance and the velocity versus the speed. Now, velocity and speed, you've probably encountered both of those and you think, oh, well, they mean the same thing. They actually don't. Velocity is a vector. A vector, if, in case you don't remember, a vector has to have a magnitude and it has to have a direction. By magnitude, we mean the size of it. So if I had, if, if I was talking about velocity, that means the size of it might be I'm going 50 miles an hour. On the other hand, it also has to have a direction. So I'm going 55 miles an hour forward, or I'm going 55 miles an hour backwards. In both cases, the magnitude is the same. I'm going 55 miles an hour. But there's a direction that's very important. And eventually, we'll do this in two and even three dimensions. I'm going 55 miles per hour northwest. So speed, on the other hand, is not a vector. It's a scalar. A scalar is just a number doesn't have a direction, it's not positive, it's not negative, it's simply a number. So your speed in this case would be 55 miles an hour. There's no direction. Your speedometer doesn't show negative 55 miles per hour if you start for some crazy reason driving 55 miles an hour backwards. It simply says 55 miles an hour. So that's one of the best examples of the difference between a vector and a scalar. We'll talk about the notation we're going to use to distinguish between those here in just a minute. Displacement and distance might be a little bit different for you. So the distance, okay, that's probably what you think of as I travel from here to here. But displacement is the difference between my starting position and my ending position. You know, well, Dr. K, what's the difference between those? And it's true that if you are actually just moving in a straight line, there is no difference. So let me bring up my pen here so we can take a picture. So let's say that this is my ground and this is my robot right here, right? And if he starts here and ends here, and let's say that, that this, let's say that this is at one meter, and this is at five meters. And so the robot travels all the way over here. How far did the robot travel? Get the camera back here. How far did the robot travel? Well, he went, you probably could easily say, oh yeah, he went four meters. That is in fact the distance that he traveled. So 
that is a scalar. It doesn't have a direction. And you may say, oh, but he went forward. Well, then it becomes a vector. So the distance does not have a, a direction. It's simply just how far the robot went. Now, the displacement is what we've defined up here on your page. And so this is a definition that you're going to want to learn. The displacement, which we're going to write this way, this delta symbol, this, this triangle, the capital Greek letter delta, means change in. Anytime you see that symbol, I want your brain to say change in. So this would be the change in my position. Now, I've got a little arrow symbol here. Some people will go ahead and draw both arrows on here. I'm too lazy to do that. But I've got a little arrow symbol here. That indicates that it's a vector, not just a scalar. So delta x with no vector, so this is the change in position, but no vector, so I don't have a direction. This is the distance that it travels. On the other hand, this delta x with a vector, the change in the position as a vector, this is defined to be the displacement. Well, we talked about the distance. You know, if I go to here and I go to here, well, then the, the distance is four meters. However, the definition of the displacement is that it's my position at time two minus my position at time one. And those times can be anywhere you want, but I'm just subtracting those two. So if I say that this is my time one and this is my time two, well, okay, then my position at time two is five meters and my position at time one is one meter. And so if I subtract those, then I'm gonna get four meters. However, that's a positive number. So I'm moving in the positive direction. So I must have that positive sign. You must have a positive or a negative sign so that we know what direction it is. And in this case, they're the same. All right, but what if my robot were going the other direction? So we're just gonna turn him around backwards. So let's say he started out at the five meter mark and then he went back to the one meter mark, all right? His distance traveled is still four meters. If you think about it, the distance traveled is how much battery power he's using. So he's still using four meters worth of battery power to come down. But my displacement is different this time. Now, my T2, we're gonna make this our T1, and we're gonna make this our T2. Now our T2 is one meter, and our T1 is five meters. So this is going to be one meter minus five meters. And so my displacement then is going to be negative four meters. That tells me that I went four meters backwards from that point. So even though my distance in both cases, delta x was simply four meters with no signs, the vector gives me a direction. Okay, that's all well and good, right? Hopefully that makes some sense. And you may say, well, this isn't helping me. What's the point with this? What if, let's get rid of get some rooms that we can write here. What if, I'm going to trace, we're going to look down on the robot's path so that I can do this in two dimensions. But let's suppose that my robot started here and then it traveled to this position. And then it turned around and came back to here. So we're going to say this is still the one meter position. We're going to say this is the five meter position. And we'll say, just for fun, we'll say that this is the three meter position. Okay. How far did the robot actually travel? What was its distance traveled? Well, remember, distance is going to be what it appears, how much battery power it's using, right? So we went from one meter to five meters. So that was four meters. Then we turned around and we came back two meters. So my distance then, the distance that I traveled with no vector sign here, is going to be 4 plus 2, so it's just going to be 6 meters with no sign. Here's where it gets a little different. My displacement is still my x position at time 2 minus my x position at time 1. So my x position at time 2 is 3 meters. My x position at time 1 is 1 meter. So my displacement traveled was actually only positive 2 meters from that. And you say, well, that's crazy. The robot actually did travel six meters. Well, sure. But let's say that you've got a machine that's running and it needs to get to some endpoint. And you don't care what happens in between. You just want to know where it started and where it ended. Well, in that case, you're going to use the displacement. All right. So let's look at some particular examples of this. Now, before I go on, take a look down at the bottom of the page here. And hopefully you've got your notes out with you. Engineers are lazy. 
we like to be lazy. That means that we're being efficient. Writing x at, at time 2 and position at time 1. Yes, English, that's what that translates as. But that's a lot of characters to write. So instead, what we will often do is we'll write our displacement. This whole symbol right here means the displacement. And then we'll just say x2 minus x1. That means exactly the same thing. x2 means my x position at time 2. x1 means my x position at time 1. There's a lot of words to say, and we're lazy, so we're going to simplify it using this kind of notation. The math that we're talking about here is not really about equations, although we'll use them as that. The math is encoding what we see on the ground with a lot of words into a much simpler, shorter, compact way. So the math is because we're lazy, because we really don't want to talk, use all these long stream of formal definitions. Okay, let's move this to the side here. So turn over in your book and let's look at the next page here. So here we have two robots and we've graphed their position versus time curve. We're gonna be doing a lot with position versus time curves, both here and in lab. All right, so let me zoom in on this so that we can see it. Now, what is the displacement that robot one moves through from time t equals zero seconds to time t equals two seconds? To do that, you simply read it off the graph. So t equals zero is right here. So that's my starting point, and that's at one meter. t equals two is right here. So I go up, see where it hits, and then I come across, and that's about 3.5 meters. Displacement, remember, is the distance between those two. It's the difference between my start and my finish. So my displacement then is going to equal 3.5 meters minus 1.0 meters. And so my displacement for robot one is going to be simply 2.5 meters. It's positive because he's moving forward. Ask yourself, what would this graph look like if the robot were moving backwards? Think about that. Well, the position is going to be getting smaller. So maybe I started out here and I went this way. That would be the case of the robot moving backwards. All right, now that you see how to do it, go ahead and pause the video, and I want you to figure out what is the displacement that robot two moves in that same period of time, from time t equals zero to time t equals two seconds. Pause the video and do it now. Did you pause the video? Don't just fast forward through it. You're not gonna get through the class. All right, so this is very easy. We're going to start out easy. We're going to keep building up until it gets harder and harder. So right here was my time zero. This was my time two seconds. And so you see we come up and we read this. And so that's at two meters and that's at one meter. So my displacement for robot two is going to be 2.0 meters minus 1.0 meters. And so again, I get positive 1.0 meters. So this is positive 2.5 meters, and this is positive 1.0 meters. I want to pause here and be really careful. Not only do we have to have the direction, we have to have the units. If you don't have the direction and you don't have, or you don't have the units, either one, you're wrong. The units matter. How many of you have ever heard of Mars Observer? Probably not many, because NASA doesn't like to talk about it. Mars Observer was an orbiter that was bound for Mars. It's going to spend a number of years in orbit around Mars taking data. So the spacecraft was launched, everything was going perfectly well, and it was designed to aero brake. Aero means air, brake means to slow down. And so what it did was it would deploy its solar panels and then dip down into the Martian atmosphere. And then the Martian atmosphere would slow it down so that it could go into orbit around the planet. This beautiful maneuver saves a lot of fuel and if we don't have to bring as much fuel, then we can pack more science instruments into it. So that's what Mars Observer was going to do. Unfortunately, the, comp the contractor that was developing the navigation data for the aerobrake maneuver was using English units, whereas the spacecraft was designed to use SI units, System Internationale. You probably call it metric. The two are not compatible. So instead of aerobraking, the spacecraft lithobraked. Litho means rock, break means to slow down. 
Kabam! $2 billion, perfectly healthy spacecraft, 10 month journey to Mars, destroyed because somebody didn't keep up with his units. Now you may say, well, Dr. K, I'm never gonna send a spacecraft to Mars. Well, there are more personal things that may come in. When my daughter was six months old, she had a very high fever. We had to take her to urgent care and the nurse was going to give her Tylenol to bring her, her fever down. Well, she misread milligrams as micrograms and gave our, my daughter a 1,000 times dose of Tylenol, which can cause the baby's kidneys to shut down and can kill her. So this was, as you might imagine, a bad scene. She was fine, but it could have been ended right there. So sloppy engineers kill people. Sloppy doctors kill them faster. So don't you kill any innocent baby spacecraft. Get your units every time. Now from a more practical standpoint, when you're working with Canvas, you must have the correct units or Canvas is simply gonna tell you you're wrong because you are. So, but there's an easy way to do this. The easiest thing to do when you're working a problem is to convert everything, just make it a rule. You're gonna convert everything into meters, seconds, and kilograms, which is a unit of mass. We'll talk about that later. Go ahead and convert it into those units. Then convert out into whatever canvas needs. And it's not as hard as you might think. Let's suppose that I have, let's suppose that I have something that is maybe 10 centimeters, okay? Now at the beginning of every homework assignment, I list what all these prefixes mean. In this case, centa means 10 to the positive two, or 10 to the negative two. So this would be 10 E minus two meters. Done. Simple as that. So there's your conversion and you're ready to go. Now you may wonder about this notation with this E here. If I were to write that out in scientific notation, that would mean times 10 to the minus two meters. And you may claim, well, Dr. K, that's not proper scientific notation. You're only supposed to have one number in front of the decimal and you're right, but we're lazy and it means the same thing and it will always work. So why not make your job easier and just write it out using the prefix. So another example, a kilometer, kilo means 10 to the third. So if I have 5.8 kilometers, that's simply 5.8 times 10 to the plus three meters. And if you don't remember what these, these scientific notation mean, this minus two means push the decimal place back two places. So one, two. So that means I get 0 0.10 meters, which is 10 centimeters. Here, this means push it this way, push it to the right. So the eight gives me one, and then I need two more zeros. And so 5,800 meters then would be my final answer. Now Canvas sometimes is gonna want things in millimeters, sometimes it's gonna want it in microns, all of this. All you have to do is use these prefixes to move the decimal back and forth, and you're good to go. And it'll make it easier for you. So that's a tip. All right, so let's see if we can start interpreting these graphs. That's the big thing that we want to do. In the real world, you're almost never going to use an equation. It's, it's actually quite rare for you to use an equation in the real world. The reason for that is the real world doesn't abide by just simple equations. There's lots of other effects coming into play. So most of the time when you're doing testing, you're gonna get some sort of graph and you've got to interpret physically what that graph means. Was the, when was the robot moving? When was it standing still? All of this kind of information. When you're sitting at Mars, you can't sit there and see the robot. All you get back is the data that it decides to send and then you have to interpret what that actually means in the real world. All right, so we wanna know which robot arrived at its final displacement. That's here. And let me slide the screen over just a little bit so you can see this one. There we go. And that's here. Notice that it didn't reach its final displacement in the same amount of time. So which robot though reached its final displacement first? Pause the video and think about it. Did you think about it? Did you actually choose this one? Make sure that you're committing. Choose one. All right. So the robot here reached its final position. Robot one reached its final position, its final displacement from one to about four in 2.5 seconds. Whereas robot two took five seconds to get to its final displacement and it still didn't go as far. It only went from one to maybe three and a half, three and three and two, three and a quarter, something like that. So we're not talking about how fast they went. We're talking about how long it took them to reach that final displacement. Well, looking at the graph then, we can see obviously robot one 
arrived at its final displacement first, and then it just shut down and waited for the other Robot 2 to catch up, and Robot 2 never actually made it all the way to it. You see how we can interpret that from the graph? Robot 1 went forward, it stopped, got there really soon, Robot 2 was cranking out, we went slower, but it never actually caught completely up to Robot 2, to Robot 1. So now we want to know which robot traveled faster. That's a different interpretation. So here we can take any point, let's say, from, let's just do from 0 to 1, right? So in one second, it traveled from here to about here. So it traveled, call it 1.2, 1.25 meters, 1.2 meters, roughly. Okay, in that same amount of time, if we go here, robot 2 only made it about from 1 to 1.5 one meters. So it only moved 0.5 meters in, a, in one second, whereas here we went you know, a little over 2 meters in one second. So which robot is traveling faster? Robot 1 is traveling faster. Okay. So now we're going to learn something about how to look at these graphs and interpret what's going on. And this is going to be a really important skill that we are building up to. So which robot then, we know that robot 1 traveled faster. But looking at the graph, which one had the higher slope? Now, just to remind you, you may not remember from geometry what the slope is. Think about it. Some can see if you can tell what is the slope. Get my camera back here. There we go. Well, you've probably heard something like the rise over the run or the change in y over the change in x. While those are correct, those are not useful. So, for example, if you look on the vertical scale here of our graph, our vertical scale is actually plotting x. You don't want to call that y and then call the time x because that's really confusing. And the whole point of all this is to get rid of the confusion. So instead, the slope is the change in the horizontal, the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the horizontal axis, whatever those may be. In this case, the change in the horizontal axis is delta x. Remember that delta means change in x, change in the position. Here, x does not mean the horizontal component. It means the position. And then the vertical component, I'm sorry, that's the vertical component. The, the horizontal component is actually the time. So the vertical component is the distance, the position, and the horizontal component is going to be the time. So that is geometrically what the slope is. And you could take any two points on this graph and you find the change in y, the change in, in x here, the change in the position, divided by the change in time, and that's going to give you the slope. Okay. So, looking at that then, which of these two curves, the position versus time curve, had the greatest slope? And you can tell that just by looking at it. You know, this is no slope. This is bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger slope. So which one has the greater slope? That's going to be robot one, because you see it's steeper. So this is robot two, this is robot one. So robot one had the greatest slope, and we also know that robot one was going faster. And let's zoom out here just a little bit. All right, so we define the average speed. And we're being very careful to call this the average speed. I'm going to use a V with no vector sign. And then you say, Dr. K, what is that weird thing sticking out? Well, that's a dark Kism that you're probably not going to see anywhere else because my handwriting is terrible. And so if you're trying to figure out is that a V or is that a U? So, you know, if I just draw that, is that a V or is that a U? Oh, no. So, for me, throughout this course, one flag means a lowercase v. Two flags means it's a capital V. If there are no flags, then it's going to be a U. So, especially when we're trying to draw with this big fat pen on here, it's going to be hard for you to tell the difference between Vs and Us, so we're going to use that convention. You won't see it anywhere else. All right, so I'm going to call the average speed... I'll write this out in words first. The average speed, and we will use that symbol, that lowercase v, to mean the speed. And then I'll put a little subscript av here so that I know that that's the average speed. Well, that's defined to be my change in distance, not the displacement, the distance that I travel, my change in position, divided by my change in time. So when we're trying to look at the units of speed, the units have to be the same on both sides. 
So whatever the units of this side, this right side of the equation are, they, must, they will tell us what the units of the left side is. Well, what do we measure position in? We measure that in meters. What do we measure time in? We measure that in seconds. So speed, the average speed then, has units of meters per second. And that's typical for pretty much any speed. Miles per hour is still a distance divided by a time from that. It's just changes in different units. Okay, so that's my average speed. Notice that there is no vector sign here. There's no positives, there's no negatives, there's no direction. It's just a number and nothing else. All right. Okay, so let's move this off to the side then. Let's take a look at the next one. Okay, so looking at microtask 2 then, here's one where I want you to pause the video and think about it. So suppose I have a robot that travels for 5 seconds, moving at 1 meter every second. That's what 1 meter per second means. So it moves 5 seconds at 1 meter per second, then it travels backwards for 5 seconds at 1 meter per second. So first question is, how far does the robot travel over the entire 10 second trip? So it goes five seconds forward, five seconds back. Pause the video, think about it, write down your answer. Make sure you're actually pausing the video, otherwise this is not gonna help you. Okay, so let's draw a little picture of what we're, what we're doing here. And you're gonna find, we're gonna teach, formally teach you this technique later, but I'm gonna need, always need to have some sort of a picture. Otherwise it gets very difficult to figure out what's going on. And eventually what you want to do is translate all these words into the picture. Then you don't need the problem statement anymore. You're just looking at a picture, just like you had the, the robot sitting in front of you. And all these are going to be much easier to work with. All right, so we had the robot that moved forward. Well, what do I mean by forward? Is that in the positive direction, the negative direction, up, down, what? Well, you probably defaulted to saying, well, forward's going to be in the positive direction. And sure, you can do that. So you could say that way is forward, since that's the way the robots are pointing, and we're going to say that that's positive. However, as an engineer, as a physicist, you get to choose three things about your coordinate system. You get to choose which direction is positive. So yeah, I could do it this way, but I could also decide that I want to make this way positive. And so now the robots are moving in the negative x direction, and that's perfectly okay. You may say, well, why on earth would I want to do that, Dr. K? Well, what if most of the things in your problem were going in this direction to the left? You know, most of your things that are affecting the robot. And the only thing that was going to the right was the robot's motion itself. Well, you're going to make the problem simpler by only having one negative than having a whole bunch of negatives. So it makes sense to go ahead and choose your positive in the other direction. The other thing we get to choose is where we want to start counting from. Now, we kind of implicitly assumed that we were going to start our initial position for our robot from zero, but we didn't have to. Remember when you looked at the graph, the robot actually started at a, a position of one meter, and then it moved on from there. Displacement, distance, doesn't care. You're still going to subtract it. So I could set my zero wherever I want. The last thing that you can change, and we'll talk about this in a lot more detail later, is you can change the orientation of it. So for example, maybe I've got a rocket that's taking off this way and I want the ground to be zero, and then I want its altitude to increase. So there's my rocket, and it's got flames and everything coming out of it. So it's moving this way, and it's moving in a positive direction, but now I'm going vertically. You can also, though, and this may be new to you, let's suppose I've got a robot that's going up a slope. I can set my coordinate system to be aligned to the slope, so I can see that that's gonna be positive. And then I'll have it come all the way down here where the robot is, and I'll have that be zero. So now instead of having two dimensions, an X and Y, or horizontal and vertical that I have to deal with, I still only have one dimension. I'm just moving up the slope. Maybe I'm going down the slope. And that's it. It's going to make your problem a lot simpler. So how do you know which one to choose? Whichever one makes the problem easier, because engineers are lazy. All right. For now, though, we don't really have any reason not to do it with a positive direction going this way, and we may as well start at zero, and why not just have the coordinate system be flat? So we've set all three. So the robot starts here, moves at one meter per second, comes out over here. So this distance is what? Well, if it moved for five seconds at one meter per second, right? It moved one meter in the first second, another meter, and another meter, and another meter, and another meter, so I moved a total of five meters. 
but then it traveled backwards, which we now know is in the negative direction. So it moved this way and then this way. So it moved in the positive direction, then it moved in the negative direction. And it still went for five seconds at the same speed. So it went five meters. So how far did the robot actually travel? What was its distance? Scalar does not involve the direction at all. That's going to be 10 meters. If you think about that distance, it drained its battery in 10 meters worth, right? Because it actually had to drive all the way up here and then drive all the way back. Okay, but let's suppose that you saw the robot sitting there ready to go. You walked out of the room, the experiment ran, went five meters forward, five minutes back, and you come back and the robot's in the same spot. What would you, and you've got no idea what it actually did in between, what would you say that the robot's speed was? Well, it didn't move, right? So you'd probably say, well, no, that robot didn't move, so its speed is zero. Well, somebody else would say, well, no, obviously it's not. The battery's drained. I can tell that it moves somewhere. So when I add in a direction, now I've got the displacement. And so remember that our displacement is going to be my position at time two minus my position at time one. Well, position at time two was zero, was zero and my position at time one was zero. So my displacement is actually zero meters. And zero, of course, can be positive or negative. So what would my velocity be? Well, we defined the speed, the average speed, to be just the change in distance over change of time. And you see that the speed didn't change. There's no direction. It was moving at one meter per second this way, it was moving one meter per second back. So if I want a vector though, if I want the velocity, and so that vector sign means now I'm talking about the velocity, not the speed, and I want the average. So you see the symbology here is actually very important. Well, I also have to have a vector over here. Well, time is not a vector unless you're Doctor Who and have a TARDIS. So that means my position, my change in position must be a vector. I must have a direction in which my position is changing. Well, we have defined that displacement to be the vector change in position. So since that vector change in position is zero, it doesn't matter how long it took, the average velocity is actually zero meters per second. And you may say, well, but, 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 but why would I ever want to do that? Because it actually did have some speed, didn't it? But what if you've designed a machine where you don't care what happens in between, you just want to make sure that this machine ends up at a certain place within a certain amount of time. At that point, you're talking about the, the velocity. And most of the things we're going to be doing in this class can be the velocity, but not everything. And so you really do have to keep these two definitions straight so that you can decide, okay, am I talking about the distance traveled and therefore the speed, which is just a number, no signs, or am I talking about velocity, which does in fact have a direction, okay? All right, so go ahead and take a look on the next page then. Zoom back out, and we will erase what we have here. Just to give us some room. All right, so let's suppose, up to this point, we've been having our robots move at a constant speed or a constant velocity. So that line was just straight. That position versus time curve was just a straight line. Well, suppose we have a robot that's powered by a rocket, because who wouldn't want that? Well. The way a rocket works, and I'll, I'll do a little sketch here. The way a rocket works is that it throws mass out the back. So there's my fins on it. So it throws that mass out the back. The fuel burns that fuel and heats it up, moves it very fast. And so as this mass comes out the back, that makes the robot, or the rocket in this case, go forward. We'll talk about why that works. You may already know, but we'll go into detail about why that works later. So. The big thing here, though, is that the mass of the rocket is going down over time. Let's think about your own experience. Let's say I have a great big heavy box and I've got a small box. Which one, if I apply the same amount of oomph to these, which one's going to end up going faster? The heavy massive box or the small light, low mass box? Well, sure, the, the smaller box, I'm going to be able to push faster with the same amount of oomph, whereas I push that oomph on the big one and it simply doesn't go as fast. The same thing is happening with the rocket. As it's throwing out the mass out the back, the total mass of the rocket, the remaining mass of the rocket, is going down, which means that for the same oomph from the rocket engine, it gets more speed. So not only is it moving forward, but its velocity is actually increasing as it moves forward. 
okay? So let's suppose that I want to figure out what is the instantaneous velocity at that instant. So I'm looking at the, at the rocket robot go by and I say, okay, what was its velocity at that second? So how would we do that? Here's our data, it's up here at the top. So what we did was we took nine photos with a high speed camera. It takes a picture every five hundredths of a second and we measured its position. How would you figure out the position, how would you figure out the velocity exactly at photo five? Now remember, our only definition of velocity so far is, whoops, not that, is the velocity, which is a vector, must equal, get my camera back, it always wants to flip out on me, there. So the velocity must equal the change in x, which is a vector, so the displacement divided by the time. Can I do this with just one picture? Probably not. So pause the video, come up with some ideas. Just jot them down in the box there, just so that you're thinking. There's no wrong answers here, but don't wait for me to tell you. Learning how to design these experiments is a big part of what we're doing. So pause the video, you got it done. Okay. Well, if I'm gonna find an average velocity, we know that we need to take two of these pictures. Now, you might say, well, let's find, since five, photo five is exactly in the middle between these two, maybe I'll take, to find the average velocity over all of that, maybe that will be my velocity for a number for photo five, right? Because it's right in the middle. And yes, I'm getting faster, but this one's right in the middle. So I would take my, my position change, which is gonna be 0 0.993 meters, always write down your units, minus 0 0.0, 0, 0.001 meters, and then I'm gonna divide that by my change in time. Well, my change in time is 0 0.45 seconds minus 0 0.05 seconds. And you see that when I subtract these, I'm gonna get meters. When I subtract these, I'll get seconds. My units are meters per second, as they should be. So that's all well and good. And if you do that then, you're gonna find that this is this top number up here. I've already worked it out on my page, but let's have you work it out in your calculator. And so I got 0 0.992 meters, which is subtracting off that one right there, divided by 0 0.40 seconds. And that works out to be a velocity of positive 2.4, uh, 2.48 meters per second. So we've got our direction, we've got our magnitude, and we've got our units. So that's the average velocity between one and nine. You might say, well, what if I only did between four and six? Shouldn't I get the same number? Pause the video and try it. Let's see what you get. Okay, so if you're gonna fill that in then, let me go ahead and get rid of everything except our result here. Let's write that down up at the top. So our average velocity from 1 to 9 was two positive 2.48 meters per second. Okay. And we've assumed that the robot is, we've got our coordinate system, so the robot's moving in the positive direction. Whichever way, that could be to the left, could be to the right, could be up, could be down, who knows? It's just moving in the positive direction, that's all we care about. All right, so let's look at the velocity from four to six, with five being, of course, right in the middle. That's a vector. So now I'm going to take my position, which is 0 0.294 meters minus 0 0.087 meters. Don't forget the units. If these, this side of the equation does not give me meters per second, I did something wrong. So the problem will help you out if you're keeping up with your units. And then my time at time six was 0 0.30 seconds. And for photo four, that was 0 0.20 seconds. So again, if we do the math, I want you to pause, make sure you've done it in your calculator. And then I got that my delta X, my change in position was 0 0.207 meters. And my change in time was 0 0.1 seconds. And if you do that math, then you get 2.07 
positive meters per second. That's quite a difference, isn't it? So obviously what's happening is the average velocity that I get at photo five depends upon the time range that I'm choosing. Well, that's not helpful because the robot is only moving at one velocity at photo five. It can't be moving at a whole bunch of them. So how are we gonna get the instantaneous velocity? All right, let's slide this over then. We'll look on the next page. We'll go ahead and, and fill in what we have so far. So for the one to nine, we had a time difference of 0 0.4 seconds. I won't write the seconds here because it's labeled for the whole column. So I'm still keeping my units, but I'm saying everything in this column has to have seconds. But make sure that everything in that column is in fact seconds. Don't try to mix units within that. You'll always get the wrong answer. My displacement then was 0 0.992, and then we said the velocity was 2.48, and that was positive. And then we did four and six, and we got 0.1 seconds, and we got 0.207 meters, and we got positive 2.07 meters per second. All right. So go ahead and work out the other two. Pause the video, and let's see what you get. We're going to see an important trend here, so it is important that you work it out. Okay, do you unpause and you got it now? Let's see if you get the same thing I did. So for between pictures two and eight, the time difference was 0 0.3. How did you get that? Well, you go back to the table. Go back to the table and read that off of that. And then my position was 0 0.687. And my velocity was positive 2.29. Then from three to seven, I got 0 0.2 seconds. I got 0 0.430 seconds. That's a four. Um, meters, sorry, and then for my velocity I got positive 2.15 meters per second. Okay, so the next question says in microtest 4 is, does it matter how large a time member we use? Well, yeah, right? You can see that we're getting very different numbers. So what happens to your calculated average velocity? This is the average velocity of photo 5. What happens to that calculated average velocity as the time interval decreases? So as I go from an interval of 0.4 seconds to an interval of 0.1, what happens to my calculated average velocity, which is this column right here? Increasing, decreasing, staying the same. Well, you can see that it's decreasing, right? So what would happen to you, your calculated average then if you kept on decreasing it? So maybe below what we even have for these pictures. So maybe instead of 0.1, you figure out how to do an interval of 0.05 if you've got a better camera, and you figure out an interval between them and you figure out the displacement. What's going to happen to, do you predict, will happen to the velocity based on this trend? So I go to 0.05 seconds. Yeah, then my velocity is going to decrease as well. My average velocity is going to decrease as well. So if I kept on decreasing that time interval, got smaller and smaller and smaller, better and better cameras. What would the average velocity at for photo five go to zero meters per second? You can see it's decreasing as I decrease the range in between. What do you think? Now you might be tempted to say, well, yeah, I can get to where I haven't let it go at all. So I've got a set effectively no, no interval change there. And so therefore its velocity is zero. But think about it, does that make sense? Always come back to the physical reality. My rocket robot is moving this way. At photo five, is it moving? Well, sure, it's absolutely moving. So therefore its velocity cannot be zero. So there's something going on here that our average velocity isn't capturing. And let's see if we can figure out what that is. So if we wanna know the instantaneous velocity, you can see down at the bottom, we know that the velocity of the robot is equal to the slope of the position of, of the position versus time curve. So let's bring that over here. And we'll erase this so we've got some room. All right, now, I'm not going to plot each dot because it takes a long time. I think you should, so that you can get a, a really good, careful idea of what's going on. But you're gonna, when you finish it, you should get something that maybe resembles this. Something that resembles this curve here. And I'm going to switch colors here so that we can see. If I were to take my 
interval here, picture one and picture nine, I connect those. Whoops, I bet we can do better than that. And connect those. Now I've got a slope, and the slope of that line is my average velocity between those two points, and it should equal what you actually calculated before. All right, well, if I take a smaller time interval, say the next one that we calculated, you should find that the slope has decreased somewhat, and so on and so on. So over time, that slope is decreasing. And pardon that my pen can't actually do very well with that, but you get the idea. So eventually, in order to figure out what that slope is at the specific point five for photo five, which maybe is right here, I would have to have a line, we'll do this in another color, that looks like this, that only touches it in one point. Well, that's called the tangent of the line at that point, the tangent of the curve at that point. And hopefully you remember from calculus, we, there's a way that we can actually calculate that. So what I want my velocity is equal to my change in position, this is a vector, this is the average, over the change in time, right? But I want delta t to go to zero. I want that time step to go to zero. So we have to take the limit as delta t goes to zero of delta x over delta t. That is my instantaneous velocity. That's the velocity exactly at 0.5 without using any kind of, of averages or anything like that. Well, do you remember what this construction is? If I take the limit of delta t goes, as delta t goes to zero of delta x over delta t, what is that? Well, that's defined to be the derivative. So this is equivalent to the derivative of x, we need to make that a vector, the derivative of x with respect to time. And I'll make that clear that that's not an a, even though it looks like one. So the derivative of x my change in position, the vector change in position with respect to time then, is my instantaneous velocity. Now here's a notation thing. From here on out, if I have just the velocity, I mean the instantaneous velocity. If I mean average, I'll specifically write out the average like you see right here. All right. So I'll just specifically write out that subscript. So with just this here, I mean the instantaneous velocity at that particular point with that. All right. So, we now have what we need, I'm going to have to erase our graph here, we now have what we need to calculate the velocity of this robot at any time. Let's move all these out of the way so we can see. So take a look at Microtask 7 here. All right, now up here at the top, at the top of the page right here, what we did was we fit a curve. We fit an equation to that curve. Now. You're going to have to do this in lab. You're going to be doing this practically every lab. So what you'll do is you'll come up with a graph, and maybe this will be the position in meters, and we're going to say our positive is this way, and maybe this is going to be the time in seconds, and my positive is this way, my zero is obviously where these things meet. And if I've got something that looks like that, do you recognize that kind of curve? You might not, and that's okay if you don't. This is a quadratic. So it goes as t squared. So we know that our function has to be somehow related to t squared. Well, what if it were a bigger change than that? What if it goes up even faster than the t squared? You know, maybe something like that. Well, then this must be cubic. It's t cubed from this. So the way you would do this is you can take your data, put it in an Excel, and it will fit a curve to it. You wouldn't fit a linear curve. You'd have to play with what's going to make it work. Try a linear curve, that's not going to work. Try a quadratic, that's probably not going to work. Try a cubic, and you're going to see, yeah, okay, that actually works. So raise it to the third power. Alternatively, you can use our data graphing program, which I will have in the modules tab so that you can download it. It'll be a zip file. You'll be able to download that. It, you don't have to install it. You just unzip it. You can unzip it to a USB stick. You can put it on your actual computer. It will only run on a PC. So if you have a Mac, or you're using a tablet or something like that, well, you're going to need to find yourself a PC, but you don't need to install it. Just put it on your USB stick, put it into the PC, and then you'll be able to run 
all of your data files that you need for lab straight off of that. Leave your data files on the stick, leave the program off the stick, and it will actually do all the calculations. It will automatically find that best fit curve for you, and it's really nice. It'll let you label all your graphs and everything. Okay, so let's say we did that. We put it in Excel or we put it in a data graphing program, and the, the line fit that we got was this right here. It was x as a function of t, so its position as a function of t, was 10.9 times the time cubed. That's a zero there. Now, one quick thing. This x, remember, is the distance, not the displacement. And if I want the velocity, I actually need the displacement. Well, but we've defined this to be a positive number. As long as t is positive, do you see that my x is also going to be positive? And my t can't be negative because I can't travel backwards in time. So I'm legal to go ahead and do it this way. And if I really want to get explicit, I can put a plus there. But because my t is going to be positive, I'm always going to get a positive number anyway. Now we said if I have a vector on this side, though, I need a vector on this side. And the problem that I've got, though, is my units also have to balance. This is meters. But this over here is seconds cubed. Well, that doesn't work. What's happening is this constant here, this 10.9, actually has implied units. And so those units, in order to make it work, would have to be seconds cubed on the bottom and meters on the top. And you see, 10 point, if I have 10.9 meters per second cubed times t cubed, my seconds will cancel and I'll be left with meters. Now, you don't put the meters per second cubed in your calculator, just like you don't put kilometers into your calculator. But it is important that you take a look and figure out, okay, what are the units of this constant? Because if it is explicitly in meters per second cubed, you cannot put in centimeters. You'll get the wrong answer. You cannot put in milliseconds. You'll get the wrong answer. So it's important that you know what unit your constants are in. Most of the time in this class, all of our constants will be in meters per second. And when it's not, I'll make sure that I let you know. Okay, so we want to find an expression for the robot's velocity at any given time t. So we can do that, we can find the position very easily. You just simply plug in your time t into the position versus time equation and you'll know what its position is, simple as that. So if I wanna know the instantaneous velocity though, again, get my camera back, then we defined the instantaneous velocity to be dx dt, the derivative of x with respect to time. So we're going to take this then, it's going to be ddt of our expression, which is 10.9 t cubed. So if you may or may not remember how to take a derivative, but I'll remind you. The constant doesn't change, it goes out front. So that's going to be a 10.9, and then it's going to be ddt of t cubed. So when I take the derivative with respect to time, I decrease, I multiply the 3 times this whole constant, and then I decrease the exponent by 1. So 3 times 10.9 is going to be, what, 32.7? Check me on that. Make sure that it works. And then when I take my lower it by 1, I get this. And so this, then, is what you're going to have here. So v, my velocity, is 32.7 t squared. Now, what are the units of 32.7? Has it changed? When we had it with distance, it was meters per second cubed. Well, over here now, I have meters per second. And I have a second squared here. That means I still need meters per second cubed so that I have one second left over here in the bottom. So my units and my constant didn't change, and that's what makes that pretty useful. Okay. So now, finally, we can do what we wanted to do from the beginning. We can find the robot's velocity in photo 5. So go back to your data table and take a look at that. And I'm not going to take the time to get all the way back over there, but just looking at my notes, the time for photo 5 was 0 0.25 seconds. So we plug that into here, and this is 32.7 times 0 0.25 seconds squared. Make sure you keep your units in there. And when I work this out, I got positive 2.04 meters per second. That's the instantaneous velocity at photo 5. Now, does this make sense? If you go back to your table where you saw that the times were decreasing, 
the smallest interval we had was something like 2.07. If I bring that delta t all the way to zero, I will get 2.04. And so that's the actual velocity that the robot was traveling at the instant that photo 5 was taken. And that gives me what we need. Right. So think about that and make sure that makes sense to you before you go on. All right. And if you have any questions about that, either come by my live office hours or uh, or simply make a discussion post. That way, everybody, if you've got the question, chances are there's 10 other people in the class who have the same question, and so we'll all get through it together. Okay, now we can go the other way. This is the last thing we're going to cover today. Suppose, instead of giving you the position versus time, I give you the velocity versus time, and this is actually pretty common. If I have a robot that's out in space, it might not know its position. It might not have any way of figuring out its position, but it can measure its velocity. It can measure how fast it's going. So let's say that we've done that experiment and we found that this was the best fit to the curve. So we plotted the velocity versus time data and this time we got a quadratic out of it. All right, so let's put that here. So V then, and the little subscript X just means in the X direction, because that's what we're saying that that's the only way that my robot was going or at least the only way that I cared about. And then the units of the whole thing is meters per second. What are the units of this constant? Well, this is meters per second. This is seconds squared, right? So I'm still gonna need that second cubed in meters. So it happens to be that this one has the same constant as the same units. They don't have to be, but they just happen to for this particular example. All right. So I wanna find the position versus time. How do I get the position versus time? Well, to go from the position to the velocity, I had to take the derivative. How do I go in the opposite direction? I'm going to take the integral. So let's take the integral of both sides of this equation. So I get the integral of, I'm just going to write v instead of v, vx, just to save myself some time because I'm lazy. And this will be 4.5, that should be a t, t squared. I can't do this integral. You have to have a dt in the case of the left-hand side, or something like a dv or whatever in the right-hand, I'm sorry, in the left-hand side and dt in the right-hand side. So what I'm going to do then, we know that v is defined to be dx dt. So I'm going to substitute that in here. So I have dx, and that of course is a vector, over dt is equal to the integral 4.5 t squared. I still can't integrate this because I don't have a, a differential over here. Well, your math teacher is going to hate this, but this doesn't just mean the derivative of x with respect to time. This is also an actual fraction. So I can multiply both sides times dt. You see that it cancels here. And so I get the integral of dx is equal to the integral of 4.5 t squared dt. Well, the integral of the differential of a quantity is that quantity. So this is simply x. Now I can do the integration. And if you don't remember how to do that, probably a good time to review it. My exponent is going to go up 1. So I'm going to have a t cubed. And then I'm going to divide this constant by that. So I'm going to have a 4.5 divided by 3, which of course is 1.5. But we're not done. What's missing from this? It's an indefinite integral. We need a constant of integration. So this then becomes some constant c. Let's go ahead and write this up here so that we've got it where we can look at it. So my position as a function of time is going to equal 1.5, that's the 4.5 divided by 3, t squared or t cubed. Let's write that a little bit neater, t cubed. plus c. So we need one more piece of information. And this is going to be true anytime you take an integral. You need at least one initial condition. And so in this case, we need to know the x position at time 0. Suppose we put time 0 into here. So if I have x of 0, this becomes 1.5 times 0 cubed plus c. Well, that's just 0. And so c then is equal to my position at time zero. In other words, it's the initial position of the robot. If the robot starts at zero, well, of course, that's zero. But let's take a look in the, in the next part. It says, suppose our robot actually started at 0 0.5 meters. So that tells me that if this is my initial condition, positive 0 0.5 equals C. So I can simply plug that back in. So my final expression then is going to be my position as a function of time is going to equal 1.5 T cubed plus 
0 0.5. And that's 0 0.5 meters. It's a constant, but it still has units. It has to be meters because I've got meters on this side as well. This 1.5 is a constant. It still has units. In this case, again, it's meters per second cubed. You see that? Because I have to get that to go away. Now I can find my robot's position even at photo 5. And you should find that you get something very close to what you had in your table. It's worth stopping the video and trying that out just to make sure. All right, so we've done a lot today. And this video was about an hour, roughly, which is roughly about what we would do in class. Probably took you a little bit more than an hour because you were supposed to stop and fill in. Overall, this course, every video is going to be roughly the same as if you were sitting in class. A few might be slightly shorter, a few might be slightly longer, but overall it's going to be exactly the same. So you should plan on that. You can't really write, you can't really work this course by fast forwarding through the video. It's not going to do it. This, we call this guided online because I'm here to help you. It's really no different than the in-person class. The only difference is, is that you get to decide when you want to go to class. You simply sit down, you work the video, you watch the video, you work through all the problems, you work through our micro tests with that, and you'll learn the material. But what you're not getting from looking at this video is this personal help, this individual tutoring. This is available for you. I'm available online. You can look in the syllabus and find those office hours. I'm happy to meet with you. Lots of students will simply just do their homework with me. And then if they've got a question, they can ask it right there. Your other alternative, if you can't make it in during the video office hours, you can also make a discussion post. Just when you make that discussion post, make sure that you give me the problem. You give me a screenshot of your work. It's not good enough just to tell you, here's the problem and I'm not getting it right. That tells me nothing. Instead, I do have to have the problem because everybody's getting different numbers for their homework. And then show me your work so that I can see maybe where you went wrong with that. And then we'll work on giving you where you need to go to fix it. Probably won't give you the answer, but I'll ask you those leading questions that'll get you there pretty quickly, all right? So if you have any questions, pop by the video office hours, come by my actual office hours in, on campus, or make a discussion post. We'll see you next time.